Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Oh, good. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. You're fine. Oh, good, good. All right. This works perfectly on my phone. It's great. Hi, Hank. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, uh-huh. Great. Lauren, I'm having a little Oops. trouble getting the embed code. Uh, that's, going to embed it. that's going to embed it in Coursera, isn't it? Oh, okay. Let me see what happens here. Um, I thought I had done this before. Where's my course? Oops. It just got embedded in the announcement. Let's see if that works. Let's see. I put the announcement. Um, I right, we'll be together in just a second. We're just getting set up. <laughs> Oh, it looks like I, I see it in your um, announcement, like the, oh, the great. edited. Excellent. Okay. But I didn't. I don't think you've sent it out, right? You I haven't. did not send it out because I think I'll get a URL for the. Um, I got a URL for the video itself, so I'm looking at YouTube to see it come up. Um, I want to see. <coughs> Here it is. Okay. So it says I'm streaming live. Okay, we're there. Okay, there's Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. Okay, we're there. Okay. There's Stephanie. Hi. Okay, so this is the URL to look at it later. Okay, so let me also let me put another announcement up. Okay, everything's working. Fantastic.
Hi, who is this? All right. Why don't we get <clears throat> Why don't we get started? I think uh, the the thing that might be interesting for everyone is to introduce ourselves uh, as we go around on the hangout. Uh, obviously, I'm Hank, <laughs> and uh, I'm happy that you all could join us today. Uh, and let me, uh, I guess, just ask people to chip in. I, Stephanie was here early, so Stephanie, why don't you go first and tell us who you are and where you are and uh, sort of what your interest is. Hi, my name is Stephanie Acosta. I'm from Barranquilla, Colombia. I'm 20 years old and I study international business at Northern University, one of the best universities in the city. I speak German, Spanish, and English. Very yeah. good. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have somebody typing right now, and you're coming up on the screen. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, it's under Regina, is that right? Is this Regina? Can you hear? Okay, let me try. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, getting kind of some feedback. So, all right. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's Gina. I'm from Den. Where are you from? We're not getting your. Uh... I'm Gina. But, uh, I'm getting. I guess I'm getting a little bit of feedback. So I don't know if anyone, um, if I'm coming in clear or not. Um, I'm originally from Arizona, but right now I'm in Denver, Colorado. And, uh, yeah, this is actually my first Hangout. I'm actually using it on my Android phone, so it looks pretty looks pretty cool and doable. All right. You're, um, you're pretty dark. Can you maybe move a little light uh, in front of you a, a bit? Because you've got a dark background, and I can kind of see your glasses <laughs> and sometimes your face. Okay, Lauren. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Niemeyer and I am in the um, support for University of Maryland Shoot. and um, I'm here, I'm going to be monitoring the Twitter feed. Oh, sorry, um, so can you anyone... see me now? Yes, that's better. My phone dropped. That's okay. Um, so if anyone has any um, questions out there, if you want to tweet them to us with the hashtag um, Hashtag SDTUMD, and then so I'm going to be reading those off as they come in um, when Hank prompts me. So I'm happy to be here today, and hey everybody, this is cool. Eliane, am I saying that right? Eliane Pole. Can you introduce yourself? I'm not hearing anything. Are you? Is your microphone on? Can other people hear her? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. Let's go to Danielle. 
Hi everyone, my name is Danielle and uh, I work with Hank and together also Lauren and we support Hank's Coursera course and I work at the University of Maryland. Um, I'm going to take your questions from uh, the discussion forum, um, the newly created uh, thread called Hangout March 28th and also I can take your questions through email. Um, so welcome on board. Uh, Hank, there's I have I do have a question for you though. Um, did you send out the YouTube link and the Twitter link? Yes, they're on announcements on Coursera. So you need to go to the Coursera website, and uh, you will find both the YouTube live stream is embedded there, okay. and there's a URL for viewing the YouTube video when it finally posts about an hour after we finished. Okay. Um... Yeah, let's see how it goes. I, some people may have some connection problems I can hear now on the video, but um, uh, let's move forward and um, okay. ready to go. Okay, Harshad, can you say hello and tell people who you are and where you are? Harshad, you're not coming through. Let's try Guillermo. Guillermo, can you say hello and tell us who you are and where you are? Yes. Hi. I'm, my name is Guillermo. That's William in English. I am originally from Argentina, Brazil, and Portugal, and I'm living in Miami. I am 59 years old and I used to teach at the University in Portugal and uh, I'm very excited with this course so I will pass along. Great, thank you. Mayor, Mayor Parker O'Toole, could you say something to us, uh, introduce yourself and where you are? Absolutely. I'm in Medfield, Massachusetts and I'm a librarian at the Medfield Public Library and Massachusetts and I'm a librarian at the Medfield and, Public And I used to work at and teach at Lesley University. And, and I used to work at and teach at Lesley University. Does, does someone have the YouTube live stream up? If so, you need to turn the volume off because we're getting feedback from the live stream. So you need to turn the volume off because we're getting feedback from the live stream. So you need to turn the volume off. Lauren or Danielle, do you have the live stream up on YouTube? Yes, I can see that. Okay, can you turn it off or turn off the microphone, the speaker volume, please. Okay, can you turn it off or turn off the microphone, the speaker yep. volume, please. It's not me. <laughs> it might be me, actually. <laughs> well, somebody did, and that's fine. Okay, anybody who we haven't introduced yet? Okay, that's great. Let's get going with some questions. Um, I guess one of the things, before I ask any questions, let me ask you, do you have some questions based on what the videos talked about and uh, the reading assignments, if you get to them this week? Ashad? Okay. Okay. Harshad, I'm not able to hear you. Um, you can, there should be a chat box in the bottom right hand side of your screen. If you want to type a question there or a comment there, uh, well, since we're not able to get your audio. Okay. Anybody else have a question they would contribute? Uh, yes, uh, if I may. <clears throat> We, we studied the case of Kodak, and uh, I do remember uh, when Fuji first came out, you know, they were very aggressive, and they were actually eating Kodak's lunch, you know, so uh, is there uh, anything that we could learn from Fuji, you know, because we learned about the things Kodak did wrong, but uh, they probably were not enough to contribute. Before they went down in digital, 
before they lost out their film business to digital photography, they had already been losing it to Fuji, you know, so I don't know if there is anything you'd like to add there, you know. Sure. Um, I didn't have time to go into depth, and I haven't studied Fuji as deeply, but I think Fuji was a real distraction to Kodak during this period. They were concerned about the film, and George Fisher, who uh, Kodak hired in the mid-90s to try and bring more digital input, he had been the head of Motorola and had turned around Motorola, um, he got taken up with the idea of fighting Fuji in Japan, filing lawsuits, and he also had the idea, though he was going to be a digital guy, of pushing film sales in China. And given how quickly people in China adopted digital photography, that was not a really great strategy at the time. Now, I have read a little bit about Fuji. Fuji evidently saw that this was going to happen, that the digital revolution was coming, and they started diversifying into other fields and doing other things. And they kind of moved a lot out of photography in terms of being as major a part of their business as it was, say, 20 years ago. So they're actually a company, if we think about our model, that probably morphed what they were doing to survive in this kind of a setting. Uh, if I may just very quickly introduce a point, because you mentioned China. And uh, we have been talking about disruptive technologies, but what we have to bear in mind is that some countries like China, they do have, you know, long-range planning at the top. So the right. Chinese government probably did not want to have an old industry come in, as they are doing with the cars right now. People don't realize, but a lot of people want to open car factories in China, and the Chinese have been saying, no, we don't want your traditional car factories. We want to have hybrid factories. You know? So maybe you can discuss it in the future, but this is a case where you know their, their, their industries were protected against the dis old uh, companies because the government intervened and said, no, we're not going to have old companies here, old technology. You know, right. you know I think it's very hard um, for companies to compete. Uh, developing countries often use the excuse that they're developing, and so they have deserve special considerations. It makes it hard for companies like Kodak to compete. But I think that the, those were relatively minor problems for Kodak, given the other, all the other things that happened to them and their kind of failure to anticipate and manage us. They were, really, they were really stuck in history. They were stuck with profitability in the past uh, and, and a mindset that was all analog and digital was just foreign to the middle managers. And it was the middle managers who really kept the, um, the, the company from changing into a digital focus. So uh, I noticed that um, Sasha, Sushant has joined us. Sushant, could you just take a moment and introduce yourself and tell us where you're from? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Hank. Uh, I'm uh, from uh, India, and I'm based in Hyderabad. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, and uh, I'm happy to join this course. Great. Thank you very much. You're helping our geographical representation here a great deal. <laughs> And thank you for staying up so late. We're going to try to do one of these maybe late at night so the people in Asia will have an easier time to join us. Okay. Um, Harshad had a question. We're having a little trouble with this audio. Uh, what I wish to ask is do we look at the frame of reference in context while discussion about a technology being disruptive? Absolutely. All of these changes that have happened have been, there have been some common elements about them. But each of these situations is unique. They're in a different domain, in a different industry. Uh, Kodak, obviously, photography. Uh, next week, we're going to look at Blockbuster and Borders. So very different industries. Um, they all have digital content. And, and since the internet is digital, that's the place where it's going to start. And that's where the people are going to be most disrupted by it. But it's moving into other spheres as well. Okay. Uh, other questions or comments? Hank, I just sent you a question from a... Um, okay. Give me through email. Okay. Um, from a viewer, would you describe the failure to adapt new disrupting technology more of a problem of taking the wrong path when faced with a fork in the road? Or is it usually more of a problem maintaining status quo and not even noticing that a fork in the road exists right in front of them? Yeah, interesting question. Anybody want to comment on that? Who's on the Hangout? Yeah. 
Yes, I go mean, ahead. I can respond. I, can you guys yeah. hear me now? Okay, go ahead. I can res respond just from my own um, experience at my job. Um, I work in a software company, and we make uh, software for the newspaper industry, which is a, an industry that's really um, being challenged right now by disruptive technologies. And from my perspective, um, it's not... It's not that they don't see the fork in the road. They're just um, they're too scared to take the right decision to do anything about it. Okay. Yeah. Can everybody have to you know they have so much invested in what they have already. All those same things um, that that you mentioned in in the lessons this week. Um, those are the things I really see playing out in in my own experience. Great. Great. You'll be interested in a couple of weeks. We we take on the newspaper industry. You'll be our expert on that one. Perfect. That's great. Now, you know, it's, speaking of that, uh, hopefully everyone can can hear me again. Um, I was actually thinking about that when I when I was posting was about I, I'd mentioned in the discussions about um, the entertainment industry, kind of kind of their push against um, piracy and the way that like Netflix and Hulu are doing their own shows and stuff, and it, it kind of made me think of the newspaper industry when you look at um, the fact that more and more people, thanks to the smartphone, the tablets, um, or even Google, you know, even as we speak, you know, we're going to Google the news. One mentioned in the forums about like you know do people still visit video stores anymore? Um, and I, I think with that, it's Mayor, did you have a comment on this? Hank, I have a question. Some questions coming in from Twitter. Would you okay. like me to read one of those? Yeah, let's let's take one of those, please. Okay, Kelly McDonald has asked. Um, your model focuses on disruptive power of internet. Does model apply to non-tech areas too? Why or why not? Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I haven't thought about trying to apply it other places. Um, I think it might because many of those factors that we list in there that inhibit a response are uh, are not really technology specific. Uh, they're really sort of general business conditions that people have, like not realizing they shouldn't consider some costs, like denying that some kind of a change is going to affect them. Um, and and today the technology is so tied up in people's business models. Uh, uh, the, the companies that are, are created built around the internet. So how do you say that the technology is part of it? It's really their whole lifeblood, their whole business is, is using the technology to enable some kind of a new business model. Did you have a second question, Lauren? Hank, I just yes. sent you another one. Okay. Um, what about the American auto industry? What about the power loss and the old innovations which need to be kept in place? Um, anybody want to? We were talking about autos a minute ago. Wilmer, do you want to say anything about the autos? Well, yes. I think that it's just a matter of time, you know, before we we start taking seriously, you know, the issue of energy and oil and pollution and so forth. So. Uh, as I was saying, you know, some countries like China, they are smart enough, you know, that they don't want to invest in old technology. So 
they're saying, you know, they're telling General Motors and Ford, and if you want to build here, you can build, but you're going to have to build either electric or, you know, hybrid cars. So, uh, maybe we cannot do it in the U.S. because, you know, of all the free, free commerce concerns, but uh, some other countries are going that way, you know. And it is a disruptive technology, of course it is, you know. Yeah. It breaks down the whole model. Uh, it's the same as Kodak, you know. There's so much in money invested in gas stations and, and you know, the whole uh, explosion motor industry, you know, they use oil and gas, you know, that uh, people don't want to go the way of electric or hybrid. You know? yeah. That's an interesting. Uh, I was speaking to an industry group of, of a month ago, and uh, we were talking about innovations, and a gentleman was there from one of the large oil companies, and he said, you know, in all of the planning that big oil did, they did not foresee the rapid decline in gas and oil prices uh, because they hadn't discovered hydraulic fracking. And it was small companies, <coughs> small companies, excuse me, who developed that technology and then everyone adopted it. Now, it looks like it may be a mixed blessing. It's controversial from an environmental standpoint. But that's a technology disruption for the automobile industry. Uh, I read that one of the major railroads is investigating converting its locomotives to natural gas. Um, and they will have to, uh, as you point out, they'll have to put in new fueling stations. In fact, we may go back to the old days where there's a tender. And instead of carrying coal, the tender is going to have compressed natural gas in it. that will follow the diesel engine down the tracks. Um, evidently, there's not much that has to be done to the diesel to get it to run on that. Um, and so it could dramatically shift the cost for the railroad if it turned out the gas prices stayed low. Well, alternative fuels like that are also going to impact Detroit. Uh, plus, a year or so ago, the president and Congress passed, uh, at least the president, I'm not sure Congress voted on this, but somehow they established much higher mileage standards in the next five years or so. That's going to be something that forces the auto industry to change, and they will be adopting technology to do that. All right. Um, okay, Elian has sent us a, a question about what do we think about Kickstarter as a method for funding disruptive technologies? Do people know what Kickstarter is? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think it's great. <laughs> um, I think one of the reasons that so many innovations come out of places like Silicon Valley and the United States uh, is because of venture capitalists and the availability of capital to start a business. Um, I have not studied this problem, but I read uh, that it's relatively easy to start a business in the United States compared to a lot of other countries, uh, both from a regulatory standpoint and from the standpoint of capital being available. So, um, you know, the Kickstarter is, is one way to do that. Uh, I think it saves the entrepreneur a lot of trouble of putting together a polished presentation for a venture capitalist and making the rounds of all those people. Uh, so if you have a good idea and it can be crowdfunded, uh, you also maintain more control of your uh, of your innovative company that way. You don't have to give part of it away to the venture capitalist. So I think it's a great model. Thank you. Is the disruptive process a hindsight phenomenon rather than a live feeling? Okay. Um, I'm being accused of being a Monday morning quarterback in the United States vernacular, that is, playing the game over again after it's all over <laughs> and telling the quarterback what he should have done. Um, I don't think I'm doing that. Uh, I think that, that you know, uh, one of the philosophers said that uh, those who don't study history are condemned to repeat it. Uh, I think that's a, a thing we want to watch out for. So some of the comments on this course that came back were, um, you know, I think we can learn a lot by looking at companies that didn't succeed. Uh, and, and we will also look at some that did. So it's not going to be entirely a, a pessimistic view of the world here. Um, but I think that, that I will say that it's very hard when you're in the middle of a disruptive technology to recognize what's going on and to choose a course of action. What we can say is that some companies and organizations have been able to do that, and others have not. And so if we can understand what happened to those who weren't able to respond, maybe we can avoid making those same mistakes in the future. 
Okay, we have a Twitter question. How much, if any, of a role does culture play in terms of a company being able to receive disruptive uh, technologies? Anybody have an opinion on that, on the Hangout? Uh, well, if I may, you know, I uh, don't want to monopolize the attention, but I do have some ideas about this. I grew up, you know, in Brazil, then I came to the U.S., then I went back to Brazil, then I went to Portugal, and I was... Uh, I was surprised by the difference in management styles and decision styles. So if you take a look, for instance, you know, Asian companies, they, there's, there's not much of a tradition of an individual going and making a decision by himself. He usually tries to build some consensus. You know? So consensus building is important in some cultures uh, versus, for instance, the U.S. where, you know, I might wake up tomorrow morning and say, hey, you know, I think this is a great idea to open a company that does this and I may go get some funding on Kickstarter and you just go ahead with it. You know? It's a much faster thing. Uh, so I believe that the, there are cultural aspects that have to do with decision making and they might influence how fast you can adopt a new technology or how fast you can discard the technology that you already have at home. You know? So I would say that the cultural effect is, is, is on that direction, you know, on how quickly do you or do you not make a decision and whether it is a consensual decision or it's an individual decision that you made by yourself basically and the problem today maybe in the US a lot of CEOs you know are doing decisions that they should never have made if they had discussed it with the board but because the board is you know sleeping with the CEO let's say you know they let him get away with it and that's why we have so many problems you know? so I'm, I'm just gonna throw those ideas for people to discuss okay. any comments I want to bring this back to Kodak as an example, um, and and also uh, talk a little bit about universities because we share certain similarities. Uh, we're not as large as Kodak, uh, though we're a big organization. Uh, but American universities tend to be very bureaucratic, and the description of Kodak is exactly that. It is a very bureaucratic organization, and I'm not sure whether this is a natural growth of companies or whether people get into a position and want to be sure they can keep it so they become quite conservative in that position. Um, I've always sort of thought that the beauty of a bureaucracy for an employee was that there are a lot of rules and procedures that are written down and if you follow those rules you can't be fired because you can always say I did just exactly what company policy said we should do in that situation. Um, and, and that's you know, it's too bad because that really kills innovation. And I think that was one of Kodak's problems. Kodak was a huge bureaucracy. Um, I read a book that a, a, a correspondent wrote, who spent some time at Kodak, and she described having pre meetings before the real meeting so there'd be sure there'd be no uh, discussion or conflict in the real meeting. Now, the only other place I think we do that is in government, right? So when two presidents meet, to agree on something, people working for them have already agreed on it because they don't want to be embarrassed by getting into a summit conference and finally saying, no, we didn't reach an agreement. So, you know, but, but that's politics and I understand that. I'm not sure why I want to see that in the company. Uh, maybe I'm just afraid it'll happen at the university because we have so many meetings now that if we had to have pre-meetings, I'd be working, you know, 16 hours a day. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, but that's culture. That's the culture of the organization. Um, and if you've worked in different places, you've probably observed that different organizations have different cultures. And clearly, if your culture is, I'm going to protect myself, I'm going to protect my job, um, I'm not going to take any risks, then, okay, you're going to find uh, a lack of innovation in that environment. Um, I joke that university faculty tend to be very liberal politically and very conservative when it comes to their own lives and running the organization. So universities are some of the last places that want to change and that's why MOOCs are so disruptive. If you followed any of the uh, uh, discussion forums, the one on MOOC has generated more comments than anything else and we're actually going to talk about MOOCs as disruptive to universities toward uh, I guess the middle or the last half of the course. 
Okay, we're talking about Kodak. We had a viewer question. Would Kodak have been better to move its business more into chemicals? Well, they tried that. Uh, they tried chemicals. They tried prescription drugs. And when uh, uh, George Fisher came into the company, he sold all those off. It was, I think Sterling Chemical, I think, was the name of the company that they owned. It seemed kind of natural to them because they were in the chemicals business. Film is a chemical process. Uh, but they took on a huge amount of debt to buy those places, and Fisher wanted to reduce the debt. So he sold all those businesses off. Had they kept them and reduced their emphasis on photography, uh, would that have been a, a strategy similar to Fuji's? I don't know. That might have been something that, that would have helped. Tricky thing with business culture from Alien is, is, is trying to change it. And that, that's the trouble the Kodak had. There's a, a wonderful interview with George Fisher after he'd left Kodak. Uh, a, a Harvard uh, Business School professor is, is asking him questions about his time at Kodak and he looks a little sad when he says, I think the top management team got it. I think we understood that Kodak had to go digital, but we never succeeded in convincing middle management. And when you've got a big company like Kodak, over a hundred thousand employees, you've got a lot of middle managers. And if you can't get them to change, you don't have a very good chance of changing the whole company. Okay, any, uh, any questions or anything coming in from our viewing public? Okay. Yes, we have, we have a lot of... Uh, topics out here on the Twitter side of things. Um, let's see, how about um, Julie has said, I wonder how much the maker movement will enhance uh, the speed of creation and implementation of disruptive technologies. And that could mean a cu country's culture or a company's culture. What's the maker movement? Does someone, I'm not sure I follow that term. Yeah, the maker movement is kind of the um, do it yourself, build things yourself, ah. try things out, grow your own food, uh, all that whole sort of organic um, reuse, recycle and, and build your own uh, build your own stuff, which I have to say I think is kind of an American phenomenon right now. I live in Denmark and we don't we hear a little bit about it but not too much and I think in a lot of the world that's just that's just life. that's how they live. whereas in America, it's it's you've been so used to buying everything and now there's this sort of movement towards oh maybe we shouldn't buy so much we should try to do things more ourselves uh, okay. um, yeah. and um, Lauren can you review the rest of that question for me again yes and it seems other people are talking I think what she was responding to also is about the self-publishing and the book industry side of things and how that's going to change um, I think that's what she was responding to. Um, yeah, uh, I have a confession to make and an apology. I really should have self-published the book that was the, uh, <laughs> the basis for this course. Uh, it, it's, it's probably not widely known to the public, but the author has very little control and very little to say about a book that they write. Um, those of you who maybe are librarians probably are aware of this. Um, but the publisher sets the format, he decides how the book is going to look, uh, he, uh, he does whatever promotion there is, which isn't much, um, and he sets the price. And uh, I had published a book with this publisher about two years ago, and it was, I don't know, $30, something like that, $35 at the most, and it was discounted on Amazon. And I just about fell off my chair when I saw the price of this was $48. I said I wouldn't pay $48 for this book. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's not your decision. Uh, fortunately, at least there's a Kindle edition now, which isn't totally outrageous, so you can avoid the hard copy. Um, it's also interesting as a sidelight that I ask him, since there's no marginal cost of the Kindle edition, if the royalties were any higher, and he said, no, you got the same royalties for an electronic copy that you do for a physical copy. So I think publishers are probably on the way to come in and 
think. Um, I think there's a real incentive to publishing your own work because you can create an electronic book and you have services that will do a print on demand if you want or somebody wants a hard copy of the book. Uh, and I think if, if that's an example of do it yourself, um, it clearly is an advantage. We'll look at the publishing industry a little bit later on. Um, the thing the publisher might do for you is they might provide some quality control uh, because if everybody in the world who wants to write a manuscript and publish it and, and put it out on the shelves somewhere, uh, then you're going to have all kinds of stuff out there. Though people use that same argument for the recording studios and at least the music I hear when cars are parked next to me and, and their speakers are shaking my car, I really wonder if there is any quality control in music. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Okay. Companies generally improve doing what they have done better, more consistently. Good short-term strategy, anti-innovation, bad long-term strategy. Yeah, um, okay. I agree fully with that. Um, you, you get focused on what you're doing now. I think it happens to all of us. Um, it's really hard when you're in operating mode, which is what most companies are in, to stop and look at a, a, a destructive technology, a disruptive technology that's coming along. Uh, there's a gentleman who's been sending me emails who was the chief technology officer for a company, and they've been very interesting uh, things that he has said said about the industry that he was in, and he even suggested that if companies like Kodak and Blockbuster and Borders maybe had chief technology officers, their jobs would have been to look at this technology and try to predict what was coming along. Um, I think that's a great position to have. I'm not sure I'd want to be in that position, uh, because I think not only do you have the responsibility of seeing this, you have to have an imagination and be able to predict what's going to happen in the future. And then the hard part is you got to sell the CEO and the other senior executives on your vision. And that's not always easy to do. Um, I, this is sort of an aside from technology, but uh, we've had a person who's been uh, uh, associated with the school as a guest lecturer and all, who was the chief information officer for a bank. And during the height of the financial crisis, uh, he talked to the chief executive of the bank to whom he reported. And I think maybe to some of the other senior managers, and he said, you know, our mortgage lending is really not very sound. That's going to come back and be a real problem for us in a couple of years. And the chairman's response was, when we want your opinion, we'll ask for it. Okay. Now, two years later, the bank had to be sold. It was essentially bailed out by a larger bank buying it. Okay. So the guy was right, but he couldn't convince the people in the company that what he was saying was right. Now, what if that had been a technological innovation? What if it had been something that said, here's a new technology that's going to change banking dramatically, and if they had said, we don't want to hear about it, then this person, in a sense, has been forced to fail in his job. Uh, there was a question on Kodak um, on patents. And uh, that's an interesting issue for them. They did make a lot of revenue from their patents. I think some of the ones on the camera must have begun to expire because it was in the 70s that uh, Steve Sasson invented the first digital camera. Um, and the, the income from Kodak's patent portfolio began to drop. And so Perez, as a strategy in bankruptcy, wanted to sell the patent portfolio. He thought it was worth about $2 billion. They eventually sold it for a little over $500 million. Mm -hmm. uh, then one analyst who reported on that said, you know, that's a little bit like cutting off your arm um, because here was a potential stream of income, an asset, that you had to get rid of in order to stay alive. Uh, and that's exactly what they did. So I think they milked their patents for as much as they could and then sold them uh, to try in a desperation move to raise some cash to stave off uh, liquidation because they're in bankruptcy. Okay. Is there a system to predict of a success? You can see in hindsight what did or did not work. Okay. 
that's what all of you are going to be able to do at the end of the course. Um, <clears throat> serious answer to that is no. I know of no system to do that. Um, I think it's just a matter of really hard work. I think you have to survey uh, a literature. Uh, you have to look at what's coming. You have to read analyst reports uh, to figure out what other people are saying might be a scenario that would happen. Um, what do I read? Okay, I read the Wall Street Journal. I read the New York Times. I read an, uh, an MIT alumni magazine called Technology Review, which anyone can subscribe to. Yeah. Uh, I'm a member of the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers. And they publish a monthly magazine for the members called IEEE Spectrum, which talks about different kinds of technology. Um, I look at uh, communications of the ACM, Association for Computing Machinery. Uh, the ACM also, for its members, has a really nice service where you get an email once a day giving you links to about 10 articles on technology that have appeared in the popular press. And I've learned a lot about MOOCs from that because, you know, it's really hard to follow everything yourself. Um, there's an application for an iPad or an iPhone called Zite, Z-I-T-E, and you can custom configure a magazine and it will go out and search the internet for news <coughs> on the topics that you're interested in. And then I teach a course on formulating U.S. science and technology policy in our undergraduate honors programs. And I have those students go away and do research and I learn from what they do. Um, Yomar. Uh, if I may say something with regard to the question that was made, if there is any kind of system that can help, you know, predict uh, the appearance uh, and impact of disruptive technology, I'd say, <clears throat> you know, it's not complicated. I mean, what these companies have in common, all the ones you're going to present through your course, and that includes Kodak, is basically that they lost touch with the customer. If they have been feeling the market, the market gives you instant feedback. You know whether or not what you're doing is going good or is not going so good. You know, so if these companies had these market sensors, you know, instead of looking at their belly button, you know, which most of them were, uh, they would probably have been able to react and survive. Okay. That's no, I disagree because a lot of times the dis disruptive technology is happening while things are going really great for your company. That's why oh, you yeah. don't see it coming. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. There is a there is a latency there, but. But even so, you know, I mean, if you have your eyes open, you can see what's going on, right? I mean. Well, if you look at Christensen's book uh, from 97, The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, he was studying the disk drive industry during a time of rapid change in, in the form factor and the density of data that could be stored on a disk. And what he observed was that each new generation of disk drive, uh, a different company won the market for that. And it was exactly, um, I think, Alien's point that um, things were going great for the incumbent, for the person who was selling the current disk drives like crazy. And they, as, as and I, I think this is a wonderful line that Christensen had, the companies had systems in place to prevent them from innovating. Hmm. And, and those were management systems. They weren't technology systems. And so... The, the argument was, my customers now are happy with what I've got. I, I think that speaks to you. My customers now are happy with what they've got. So why should I be out there trying to convince them to buy some other product? I'm, I'm rolling in money from the things I'm selling them now. And I don't, I, I don't see a need to develop the next generation of product. Now, I think that's a crazy idea, right? Because... Um, if, if particularly in, in electronics and technology, the, the pace of change has been so dramatic and so fast, you've got to be looking at the next product. I, I don't know, we've used the auto industry, I would guess automobiles are probably planned four or five years out, right? Um, mm -hmm. they, always, they always introduce a, a model at an auto show a year or two before they actually put it into production. So we know that there are industries that are thinking about the next product. Boeing is thinking about the next airplane. Airbus is thinking about the next airplane. Well, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, well, what I was going to say, you know, is that when we talk marketing, people usually think, or, or the market, we, people think about their customers. Well, the most important component of a market is to people that are not your customers, you know, mm -hmm. the people that are not using what you make, the people that are not using the technologies that you're trying to sell, you know. So I think that has to do a lot with the kind of scope 
you know, that you put in the systems that you build to get feedback, you know. So if, if you're building feedback from your customers, of course, you know, they already are your customers, you know. But if you're taking a look at what people who are not your customers or who are not even users, you know, they're going to see why, okay, I, I'm great, I have a 90% market share, but we only, you know, only 25% of the people in the world use my things, you know. Why doesn't the rest 75% use it, you know, and then you can expand, you can kind of think out of the box, you know, and take a look what's happening around, because sometimes, you know, you're talking about disk drives, I'm an IT guy, you know, I used to work for that, so today I, I will not buy a hard disk anymore, I will probably just use, you know, DRAM memories, you know, smart SD cards or whatever, you know, or even the cloud, you know, which makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, got some questions here. Uh, What's your opinion of the flipped classroom model? Is this considered a disruptive technology per se? Absolutely. Can I, can I uh, sure. interrupt? Um, I, we're having questions coming from under different subjects now. Mm -hmm. So I will send it in, and then it's up to you to organize to put them in clusters. So okay. uh, you see I have one question sending you about um, the, the TACO business related and there's another question coming about um, Kodak I think yeah um, so yeah. and then there'll be MOOCs related so it's up to you I just let you know it's up to you to organize them so we don't okay. go back and forth on that I'm, I'm sorry to hear that but I'll, <laughs> I'll try no, it's great we just have we got too many a lot of good questions we yeah. try to uh, get everything covered okay um, the flipped classroom uh, that's what we're doing folks <laughs> MOOCs are a flipped classroom and uh, I think that uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, looking at the age of this crowd, no disrespect, I imagine we all are digital immigrants and not digital natives. Uh, mm -hmm. We probably learned yeah. arithmetic with the teacher telling us how to solve the problem and went home and we did homework and turned it in. And flipping it is just the opposite of that. We watch a video um, and, and then we go to class and we work <coughs> on solving problems. And uh, this last, uh, just before the Disruptive Technologies course started, I finished teaching a uh, blended course in which we did exactly that. All of the lectures were on video, and in the class we discussed case studies and current news stories and things of that sort. So I did no lecturing in the class. And I think that's the educational model for many courses in the future, not for every mm -hmm. course. My 20-person seminar that I teach on uh, in the honors program, the students go out and do research and present the research. Uh, they're all on campus. There's really no need to do a blended or a flipped class there. But there are probably half or more of our classes that could and probably should be taught them. Okay. What are your insights on the telco business? VOIP, iMessages, Skype, and services influence on telco companies. Thanks and hello from Lithuania. Great. Thank you, Lithuania. It's nice to have you here. Um, okay. Uh, telcos are in a rough spot right now. Um, I was just reading in this morning's paper that there are apps for your phone that allow you to send text messages without going through your cell phone provider. So that the text message is handled over the internet, or at least it doesn't get recorded, there's no meter running. And if you look at cell phone companies, they make a lot of money from text messages, so that's a real threat to them. Um, I think what we're doing is a threat to telecom companies. I think Skype is a huge threat to telecom companies. Um, I, I had some students in that last class who did a report on web RTC, real-time communication. They are working on embedding browser-to-browser -browser communication capabilities into the browser, so you don't even have to go through a server. Uh, I guess that's a threat to Skype, but it's, it would mean essentially that my browser and your browser would establish a link and we would have video and audio going back and forth. Um, I think that the, this is so dramatic that at and has started making noises to the Federal Communications Commission that it would like to shut down its landline, old wire-based landline system uh, mm -hmm. and go everything to voice over internet protocol uh, because it's so expensive to maintain two systems. No, I think telcos are, are being disrupted right now. Um, let me let me just go back one one bit to uh, the question about how do you predict this? I said you got to go out and scan the environment. You have to try to um, uh, to get 
ideas and understand what's coming. And then what I like to do is to, to have a, a, an organization create some scenarios. And maybe what you do is you create three of those. You create one that says, this is what is most likely to happen. This is really the worst case if things go downhill <laughs> fast for us. And here's the best case that could happen from this. And at least use that to discuss what your decisions ought to be uh, going forward. Um, there's no one right decision. You're going to be making a series of decisions about this. Uh, and they may be to, to turn down the emphasis on one business, to start a new business, to invest in acquiring another company. Uh, but these are all things, and, and somebody asked about how specific is this to the situation. It's absolutely specific to the situation, the product, the service, uh, what you do in your business. Yes, if I may, as you know, this, this whole idea of building scenarios began with the Royal Shell Company out of Netherlands. They started this about 40 years ago. They have a strong department that does that. You know, they have futurologists, if you wish. You know, they create different scenarios for the company, and then they discuss, you know, and of course, this is very privileged information, which they do not disclose. But the book that I put on the notes, you know, it's called uh, The Living Company by Aria de Geus. It's very important because Shell decided to study what made companies live long. And to their surprise, you know, they found that there are companies that are 1,500 years old. And it's not, I'm not talking about the Catholic Church. You know. There's a lot of companies on all over the continents. They're very, very old. And, uh, and they, dis they, they study what are the characteristics that made those companies live long and survive. I'm not going to talk about it here, but it's a very interesting reading, you know. It's called The Living Company. And it comes out of Shell out of that idea of building scenarios, you know, so that Shell can survive and thrive, you know. They were worried about it 40 years ago, and they, they are surviving, so they must be doing something good, right? <laughs> yeah, we have a problem in the United States that we don't go back 1,500 years. Um, the oldest company, one of the oldest companies I know about was Kodak, which was 130 years from the file for bankruptcy. IBM, I think it was last year, had its 100th birthday. Uh, the uh, the stock exchange, New York Stock Exchange, is one of the oldest organizations, uh, and you may have seen what happened to it, okay? Because it now is being forced uh, to merge and is really being bought by uh, by uh, Nice in um, in uh, Atlanta, ICE. Uh, what is it? Uh, International Com uh, Commodities Exchange. I've, I've I've got to go back and look at the the details, but essentially the New York Stock Exchange is not going to be New York anymore. <laughs> and there'll be a physical floor there, but the people who have bought it are out of Atlanta. Um, TV is being disrupted by online video. Are we in the first stage of what was digital photo to Kodak? Will we see broadcasters failing? Uh, yeah, I think there's a good chance of that. I think that network television right now is in trouble. Um, People don't want to buy, uh, let me go the other way, um, the bids for shows in the fall, what advertisers are willing to pay is dropping uh, because people are not watching network television or they're recording it and skipping the commercials. Uh, people want to see things when they want to see them. So um, it's, uh, it's a challenging time for them. Uh, you have uh, sites like Hulu, and you even have some of the network sites themselves who the day after the show is on make it available for streaming on the Internet. Uh, so they're actually cannibalizing themselves, which I think is fine. You've got to do that. Uh, but they've got to develop a model because nobody's paying for that streamed video. Uh, the, the, the studio isn't getting much revenue from that. <laughs> How do you think disruption occurs differently within for-profit organizations versus governmental bureaucracies such as K-12 education? Yeah. I think it's easier in for-profit institutions because of the profit motive. Um, I think it's harder in K-12 or universities to make those changes because um, it's just, there's not a, we talked about culture a while ago. Um, I'd like to see companies and all organizations have a culture of innovation. Uh, and that's hard to bring about, and I think it's less present in government than in, in most private industries, and I think that's the profit motive that does that. Uh, 
Okay. Sushant has just asked if, if, in addition to the survivor model, is there a lack of information when the incumbent is not tracking consumer behavior? Absolutely. Um, Carly Fiorina, who was chairman of Hewlett Packard for about five years, is an alum of the Smith School, and we interviewed her a couple of times about Kodak to get her perspective on it. And, and one of her comments was, um, I think Kodak felt that it knew what the consumer wanted better than the consumer did and that it was in charge. And in today's environment, uh, the consumer is in charge. It's not the producer. Uh, and so the consumer voted by going out and buying digital cameras and abandoning film. So uh, I think that's absolutely Stephanie asks, um, has Apple learned the art of disruption technology? I've noticed that Samsung, not only since the point of view of cell phones, but also electronic products they offer, seems to be in a constant state of innovation. Yeah, it's an interesting competition going on between Apple and Samsung right now. Uh, they've been fighting about it in the courts. They're fighting about it with the products they produce. Uh, Apple will be one of our examples of a company that has successfully morphed itself uh, and actually has become a, a technology disruptor in itself. But I think your example shows that the disruptors can be disrupted as well. So uh, they can, the, the Samsung is coming back at them, and certainly Google is, uh, has taken over the lead in smartphones with the Android operating system as opposed to Apple's iOS. I was a little disappointed a lot of the same innovation picks came up. I found so many radical tech innovations that are so far ahead of their time just from half an hour Google search. Why do you suppose so many innovations are overlooked? Would that be considered unproven or unsuccessful innovations? Well, you know, I had some of that same reaction. It may be a sign of age, uh, but it seemed like all of our innovations had been in the last 10 years. Uh, I expected at least someone would talk about the wheel and fire and, and a few, few things like that. Uh, but most of them tended to be electronic. Uh, and, uh, well, I guess I should put back, there was a, the washing machine was in there. That one surprised me. Uh, and uh, birth control and a couple of other things. Uh, so uh, it was an interesting set. It certainly was a question that generated a lot of responses. Uh, I think that, first of all, I think it's hard to discover some of the more radical things that are out there. And um, I think also a lot of the things that you hear about or you read about that are kind of radical, unfortunately, never make it. Okay. They mm. don't become products. If you look at the pharmaceutical industry, they talk about numbers like, you know, one out of hundreds or one out of thousands of the things they look at actually turns out to become a drug. Um, and you read about tests of medicines in animals, mice, and monkeys, and things like that, and then it doesn't work in a human being. So again, I think there are a lot of um, promoters out there for very radical technology, and, and maybe we're all just a little bit on the conservative side. We want to see something that that we think is actually going to get there. If I may? Yes. Okay, uh, just very quickly, just mention Apple. And, you know, I have been a technology guy for over 50 years almost. And I can tell you something, you know, Apple, I've seen it come up and come down and come up and come down. And they, they are very successful right now, but I, I'll tell you, you know, Apple may not be around in the next three or four years. And the reason for that is because they are sticking to proprietary things like they did in the past. Proprietary, you know, takes you, makes you successful for a short while, you know, because what Apple sells is not cell phones. They don't sell that. They sell, it's a boutique product, you know, they sell a fashion statement. But fashion statements change, and fashion statements change very quickly, you know. And the other company I also see very risky, you know, and may not be around in the next four or five years is Microsoft. So this is being recorded, so maybe four or five years from now, like, hey, hey, look at that, you know. Because the reality is Microsoft has not innovated anything for the last 20 years, you know. They are living off a cash cow, which is Microsoft Office and licenses for the Windows system, you know. They don't really innovate. They've been buying companies like Skype, and that's a sad thing because, you know, what I noticed, you know, I started using Skype when they came out. What I noticed is that after Microsoft bought Skype, the company became very mediocre, you know, and probably going downhill. Mm. Want to be overridden by all those, you know, uh, browser built-in VoIP and image, you know, transmission things. So 
right now, I would say Apple has got to see the writing on the wall, and Microsoft also has been looking at the writing on the wall for quite some time. You know? I don't think they're going to last longer than three or four years. Interesting prediction. Um, I'm not going to go on that one because I. <laughs> yeah, we don't have time. I don't no, think I that. think that's really interesting. I think that's really interesting, especially uh, the, the whole problem with Apple being locked down to pr pr proprietary uh, tools and software. I mean, if you if we go back to the whole um, maker culture, the idea behind maker culture is if you don't, mm. if you can't open it, you don't own it. Right, you can't get in there, you can't yeah. fix it, mod it, hack it, then it's not something you own. And that's the whole problem with Apple products. They're great, they're beautiful, but you can't fix them. If you have a problem with your Apple computer, you have to go into them to get it fixed because it's almost impossible to do anything. And I mean, you look at an iPad, you can't even open them up or an iPhone. And that's the beauty of a lot of the Android uh, tools, right? It's there for you. You have access to all of it. You can write programs. You can hack it. You can do whatever you want. And that is a that that's disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole open. Mayor, go ahead. Yeah. Wait a second. I'm trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um. I think you just muted yourself. We were hearing you before. Now you're not coming through. Okay, there it is. There How's go. that? That's okay. Good. No, I was thinking uh, the whole open source movement is having a huge effect everywhere because it's threatening companies like Microsoft and Apple and any of the proprietary companies because it's it's sort of a world um, cooperation to provide all of the resources we need essentially for free, um, which is just wonderful. I mean, I can go. Um, online and I, I use a lot of Linux stuff and I can find just about any tool I need and download it and use it you know whether from operating system on on out um, and I think that's a fabulous change that's sort of rocking everyone's boat yeah that's yeah, really forget Cupertino there are an awful lot of engineers sitting in India <laughs> but you know that's a that's a real uh, disruptive technology for any proprietary software and I agree with you about Apple I think uh, th the thing that they have done which may give them a lease on life is that they have opened up their app stores and they've invited people to write mm -hmm. these three four five hundred thousand apps however many are there and so that gives them a kind of an installed base of activity though people are also writing those for the Android so uh, mm -hmm. it's certainly not something that locks you into Apple's products an interesting question <coughs> from uh, uh, email. Telcos are being disrupted and they're disrupting other industries like pay TV. Uh, content aggregation, almost every single content provider can reach millions of consumers through any screen connected to the internet. Um, this is, this is a, an industry I looked at but I didn't try to include it in the course because I find the video scene right now extremely confusing and changing all the time. Uh, I happen to be working at home <clears throat> uh, partially because I have a 75 megabit Fios internet connection here and I only have a 10 megabit connection in my office, Lauren. <laughs> um, so I have much better bandwidth here. Uh, but Fios also wants to sell me cable TV services and they have my phone going over the fiber optic uh, line. Uh, and, and so they're trying to compete with Comcast and uh, everyone is trying to compete with everyone else and you've got the, the pipeline which is the Fios fiber optic line then they're now a content provider uh, you've got Comcast which is a cable channel buying content from people uh, you have fights between the content providers and the cable channels the most expensive cable provider in the United States is ESPN which is owned by Walt Disney. Uh, ESPN has all of the sports networks on it, and cable companies feel that they have to offer sports as a part of their package though um, last month Fios unbundled and offers now two subscriptions one with ESPN and one without ESPN that's about fifteen dollars a month cheaper uh, not to have the sports mm -hmm. networks so there's a, a real ferment going on here uh, between the people who provide the content and charge the cable companies for it. Uh, and then you've got Netflix thrown in on top of this, which is confusing everything further. 
uh, with downloading and streaming television shows, particularly, and movies, uh, plus producing original content. So Netflix has produced one original series of 13, and in another month or so, they got another original series uh, program coming out that they have created themselves. So I think everyone in that industry is trying to search for a business model. Uh, the, the movie industry, the studios are doing the same thing. They're closing the window between the time the movie shows in the theater and it's released for pay-per-view or for streaming or on demand and it comes out as a DVD. And it's conceivable that in the not too distant future you'll see all of those things happen at once. And that's going to be an interesting kind of shakeout uh, in that industry. And, and telcos, uh, as well as, as the studios, as well as the, the TV networks and all, are right in the middle of that. If, if I may quickly say something, you know, most of your work, as you have said in the beginning, is based on the Internet aging, acting as a facilities disruption for changing the paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. The problem that I see right now, you know, in the U.S., is that uh, the price of the internet is too expensive. For instance, you know, Eliane is in Denmark, I have a home in Portugal, and I, I got 100 megabits per second, you know, for $50. Okay, 100 megabits per second for $50, you cannot get it anywhere in the US. And that is because, you know, that's the reason why, you know, in order to create new, new industries, in order to disrupt old industries, uh, one of the things you need is critical mass. If, you know, maybe, maybe 5% of the U.S. homes uh, could have 100 megabits per second. I'm not saying they have because they don't, but maybe they could because of the infrastructure. So the big problem here is if the U.S. wants to lead creating new companies, they use the Internet, it does not have a place to sell them. You know, either they solve the infrastructure problem by very, very quickly making it available to 100% or 70% of the population, or those companies will not be able to grow their business in the U.S. You're going to see newcomers coming from Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Spain, Germany, where you know where they do have high speeds available and they can create new things. You know, or even Singapore, which is very small, but everybody there. 20 years ago, when I went, they had flat screens and they were using DSL. Whereas in the U.S., they were still using 2400 bits per second. You know? <coughs> so that's something that I'd like to think about and maybe bring up in the future, which is America has to pay attention to its infrastructure. The costs are very high. There is a lot of digital exclusion. People don't have equal access. They don't have equal rights. But the worst thing is the companies. They are not able to develop products and services because they don't have the critical mass they need. Sure. Um, I agree with you, and I think that uh, Google agrees with you because they're starting a gigabit internet service in a Kansas City suburb. And I think if that proves to be highly successful, that there's going to be a lot of pressure on the internet service providers to increase the capacity of what they offer. Uh, Fios can give me any number of speeds. They don't have to run a new cable out here. They're doing that from a marketing standpoint and from a revenue standpoint as to what they charge me for going from 10 megabits to 75 megabits. So um, I think we're running a little bit over. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining me. There were just a couple of questions here uh, that I want to address very briefly. One of them, uh, we've seen a lot of companies that have failed uh, to recognize disruption. Are there any examples of companies that have learned successfully? And I was kind of saving those for the end of the course to end on a high note because I don't want anybody to go away from the course depressed over all the companies that we've seen failing. So we'll talk about some of those later on. And then I had a, a question asking if Frankie was barking in the background. Um, actually, Frankie is taking one of his mini naps uh, this afternoon, so I didn't drag him into the Hangout. But maybe in a future Hangout, we'll have him put in an appearance and say hi to everyone. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I appreciate the fact that we, I think we managed to get through most of the technical problems that we had. Uh, I enjoyed the discussion. I'm very pleased to see that we have so many people join us from outside. And I think we'll probably want to do some more of these. So thank you all for being pioneers. And have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Yeah. Bye now. Thank you all. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you all. Thanks.